Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Summer of Atlassian. Today I have the amazing Ray here with me, and uh, we're going to be chatting up about her new consulting firm, uh, Hurricane Consulting, and I'm sure we're going to get into a lot more details. So thank you, Ray, for being here. This video is presented by Resolution. Yeah, thanks for having me. I always I love an opportunity to work with you, Alex. So I think this is our third time doing something together. I think it's our third, but it's our first time without a crowd. Oh, that's true. This is our first recording. Yeah, this oh, is the first one. Sense. And it's the first one on the main channel. So welcome to oh, like 100,000 more people <laughs> than on the Jira Life. <laughs> Hello, it's me. You've never heard of me, but you're about to. <laughs> you're about to. What chat world? <laughs> Are you going to rock him like a hurricane? <laughs> <laughs> Here I am. Just hit you like a hurricane. It was so funny. A song came on. Um about when I was walking home from the grocery store this morning, that was just all like, I call myself a hurricane. And I was like, yeah. And then I realized I was just like turning into my mother, getting really hyped, walking down the street, speaking to no one. <laughs> I so, imagine that for Halloween, you'll have to just dress up like Storm from X-Men. Oh gosh, yeah. That or just like, just get a bunch of like little cardboard cutouts and just come like a little tornado or something. <laughs> Although with all the stuff that's been happening uh, in, in the middle of the United States right now, I don't think that would be in good taste. There's lots of- yeah. I have a house in St. Louis, and my dad was like, "Hey, is your house still okay?" I was like, "I don't check up on it a whole lot. I should probably follow." You you might want to look into that one. Yeah, there's been a. I think they said there was something like one of them damaged or destroyed 200 structures, and unfortunately, there were seven deaths. Let's get, we can strike this <laughs> like natural disaster talk. Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you the story about my first uh, uh, tornado in St. Louis. Ooh. I'm from Southern California. Never had severe weather. Heck. The word inclement weather and severe weather were, I just don't exist in my vocabulary yeah. because it's 75 degrees every single day. Yeah. All 365 days. Right? I mean, you're, you're a Cali girl too. You, you know yeah. exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> and so I get to the Midwest and I remember we're watching the Big Bang Theory and this was like, I don't know, mid to late April. And all of a sudden, like my Big Bang Theory gets interrupted and like, it just goes away. <laughs> and the news comes on and they're like, if you can hear this message, you should get into the innermost lower part of your house, like immediately. And we look out the windows and all of a sudden, like all the garage doors start closing and all the basement lights start coming on. And we're like, uh oh, it's time to go. But we've never had an emergency because our earthquakes, you don't get up any prep. No. So we're just like, screw it. We're, the ground shakes, the ground shakes, the building falls on you, get underneath the table. We're yeah, good. Like, oh, well, yeah, stand in a doorway, you'll, you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah you're, you're fine, right? Like there's no prep for it, right? But over there, we're like, I, need, I was like, do we get our laptops or we get like, we don't do we get food? <laughs> what do we do? How long does this last? <laughs> but then the news guy's like, but he's calling it out. He's like, it's crossing this street and it's crossing this street. I'm like, the streets are starting to become familiar. <laughs> oh no. And my son's like, I need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Sir. <laughs> now is not the time for your bladder to be acting up. <laughs> yeah. So he's over there. We're listening. We're scrambling. He's he's like doing his thing. We're just running up and down the stairs, scanning our computers and just electronics and everything, whatever we need to survive. I'm calling my mom to say goodbye. Just oh, this, this is so dramatic. You're like, mom, there's a tornado. I, it, it was so nice knowing you for my entire life. <laughs> then she doesn't pick up. <laughs> so I'm leaving her a voice, but just in case. So we're calling my in-laws. We're calling everybody we know. We're like, this oh is my it. God. Turns out, like hurricanes don't really hit St. Louis all that much, at least St. Peter's or St. Charles where I live. And it kind of just like, I think a shingle fell off of a house. <laughs> it's giving New York earthquake. Like when it was like, like things like fell over and everyone's like, we will rebuild. And I was like, California. And I was like, this is child's play. Like y'all were freaking out about like what, like something that didn't even hit a six magnitude police. Yeah. So anyway, that's my tornadoes, my very first tornado experience. And never again will I live in the Midwest again. <laughs> I mean, well, but I think it's so funny because every corner of the United States has their own little natural disaster that just like they're so chill about. Like I lived in Miami for a little bit um, my sophomore year of high school and like they were so zen about hurricanes and people in the Midwest are all zen about tornadoes and Californians like we don't care about earthquakes. I remember that's one of the first questions I would always get asked in Miami. And then again, when I moved to New York is people would be like, so earthquakes. And I'd be like, what about them? 
What about him? Yeah. yeah like I don't think about case, it. You can't do anything. <laughs> yeah, no, like literally because of the, there's no warning, right? Like, I no. think it stresses you more out when you do see the hurricanes, when you see the tornadoes, because you're like, you're watching this thing. Like, it, yeah. it becomes your life. Like, we can have one right now, and I'd shake around and go ask the kids and make sure I don't smell gas or anything, and then I'm back to life. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you just like, you know, like the vase falls over, you just pick it back up, and you're like, that was mildly inconvenient at best. I remember the first earthquake I ever experienced. It was really funny because I was in like somewhere between fifth and seventh grade. And we were learning about earthquakes and tectonic plates and everything in my science class. And the house I grew up in, the entire back wall was glass. It was an Eichler. And I used to love to lay on the tiles when it was warm because um, the tiles were nice and cool and I would do my homework there. And we had raccoons that used to like run on the roof all the time and they would just kind of sound like this little mini stampede. So I'm doing my homework right by these windows and all of a sudden, I'm like, God, the raccoons are really going off because it's like the whole house is like shaking. And I was like, oh my God. And my mom just grabs me and she's like, Ray, get away from the windows. Cause she was like, it wasn't a big earthquake, but these were like single pane glass windows. This is before double pane was like a massive thing when this house was built. And so she was just like, you're going to get, she wasn't even worried about the earthquake. She's like, your little ass is going to get sliced if you stand here. <laughs> so just get in a doorway. Um, but it was really funny because I didn't even register that it was an earthquake. And I was just like, they're doing my homework on the floor. Like, wow, the raccoons are popping off today. <laughs> oh man. Um, I remember well, I lived in San Diego, so I was really close to Camp Pendleton, and they mm. do bomb testing a lot. And oh, wow. Yeah. We're practicing, right? And you feel the the hits, and yeah. the wind would rattle. So every time that an earthquake would hit in San Diego, it would give me the same sensation. So I, so every time I pause, because I'm like, is it bombing? Is it on the schedule? Yeah. <laughs> or is it like for real? Like, actually do something now, because it's like a real earthquake. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's so difficult mm. to figure it out. Well, and it's, but you bring up an interesting point about, like, and this is actually <laughs> bringing it back to things that I'm interested in. <laughs> this is psychologically proven um, when it comes to pain, too, is the anticipation of pain is always worse than the pain itself. That's why you'll see, like, a lot of pediatric doctors when they're getting ready to, like, you know, give shots and stuff. They'll say, like, okay, I'm going to do it on three, and they'll do it on one, or they'll do it on two. Um, because it's, like, that anticipation of, oh, my God, the pain is coming actually makes the pain worse. And so it, I could see it being a similar thing for natural disasters. Like you're watching it come towards you and it's going to just increase the anxiety and increase like those doomsday scenarios in your head versus like, if it just happens and you're like, Oh wait, I'm, I'm fine. So <laughs> then it's not that big a deal. Um, but it is really interesting. Like anticipation is, is such an amplifier. Kill people. <laughs> it's not the yeah. drop. It's the, the tick, tick, tick. You know, I yeah. heard that they add that click, 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 like for a dramatic effect. For no other reason. It, doesn't it works. Have to be doesn't it, have to be it, on the roller coaster at all. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's so funny. Well, it's like, yeah, it's entertainment value for everything, but I yeah. used to block out on roller coasters when they went down too fast. I had like issues with acceleration. I don't think that happens to me anymore, but. <laughs> Come back to uh, Southern California, take you to Magic Mountain. Um, But did, but on the topic of psychology, right? Um, I definitely think I wanted to definitely bring this back into what we did want to talk about, which is a little bit about what you do, but. I do want to give you a tangent. So I know we didn't prep for this, um, but I read a book. So I guess I should give you a little bit of backstory. Um, in 2015, I took a cybersecurity sort of uh, class in St. Louis. And my professor, he went on to, he was a cybersecurity expert, right? So he, mm -hmm. he hacked for a living. But um, he did something interesting. He wrote a book back in like 2020, 2021. And it was titled The Smartest Person in the Room. Hmm. And, and the reason that I think this is relevant for you, and I think you're like, and I wanted to start the discussion here is, so the premise of his book is <clears throat> in IT, right? Because obviously at last in Jura, it's an IT product. Mm -hmm. We tend to have really, really smart people in a room. Yep. Right. Really uber PhD folks, right? Just the caliber of the users that use the Atlassian tools, right? Tend to be very, very smart individuals. Yes. And Jira or the Atlassian tools are, are kind of there to help govern. But it's such an interesting phenomenon because you have these uber, uber smart people. There's this tool that Atlassian makes. And then you have folks that are not necessarily like, you don't get a PhD in project management. Right? Yeah, yeah. Right? And so so the skill sets are, I don't want to say the skill sets, but I think like the level of like respect that people have each other. I think PhDs respect other PhDs. Mm. But usually when you don't, it's kind of harder to take instruction from like ranking, right? Like military ranks, right? Yeah. Kind of style. And so the, the reason I bring out the smartest people, person in the room is because the whole premise is, these really smart individuals are the ones that are kind of making it hard for, for the world to function, hmm. right? Because 
the ego and the psychology behind being so smart versus just common sense and having empathy for each other, yeah. like it, it just completely overrides common sense at that point, right? Like people are yeah. just so smart that they don't have any empathy for each other. And mm -hmm. so the, my professor wrote in his book, like he believes that the whole reason we get the, the cybersecurity and all the problems we have in IT is not because we have dumb people, but it's in fact the opposite, right? It's because the people are so smart that they don't have any emotional in the intelligence to mm. be nice to each other, to work together, mm -hmm. and to care for each other. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to kind of maybe start there and get your thoughts, and then we can dive deeper into what you do. <laughs> yeah, no, I actually love this conversation topic. And funny enough, um, so I, I don't know if you saw my post or not, but I graduated therapy on Saturday. So my therapist I officially did. like released I me. Also <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, but it was like, you know, she officially released me. She's like, hey, you know, like you come back if needed, but otherwise go out on your own. But before that, she and I were talking during my last session about um qualifications for the work I do because she was we were talking about imposter syndrome and I told her because I you know I originally started out hurricane consulting wanting to go into businesses and create change in businesses but I've gotten so many inquiries about individual life coaching like people who are like hey like I you know my business is never going to hire you but I would love to talk to you about how I can make my life better how I can you know work more efficiently for myself with my neurodivergences. And, and that's really exciting. But I remember telling her that one of the imposter syndrome things I'm struggling with right now is kind of twofold, right? Where I basically, I call it my accidental minor because I took so many psych classes in college that when I was about to graduate, they told me that I was like two classes away from getting a minor in psychology. And they're like, do you want to take them? And I was like, hell no. I wanted my <laughs> last quarter of college to be easy. I was such a party girl, like my senior year and my priorities were not in line whatsoever. So if you can get an extra minor, do it. Um, yeah, but do I was, it. you know, I was majoring in booze and boys. So that was my problem. <laughs> um, but my, I got that phrase from my mom, by the way, who, you know, she settled down eventually too, but like mother, like daughter, we, we had our fun days. Um, but I was like, you know, like I've studied this. I continue to read about psychology. It's one of the topics. Like I know more about psychology than I do about modern world events. I don't know what that says about me, but I'm more interested in learning how the mind works than, than everything else that's going on right now, because how the mind works is what causes everything else that's going on right now. But I digress. Um, but I told her, I was like, I know I have the knowledge to help these people, but I don't have a PhD, right? Like I didn't go to school to, to do this for a living. It's just something that I ended up being interesting in or interested in and kind of fell into. And so where I get imposter syndrome on one hand is knowing that there are people out there who like, they studied this, they went to school for this, like, this is what they've done. This is what they will always do. And I feel like, you know, just some guy on the street who's like, I thought the brain was cool. So now I made it a business. But on the other side of that, what she and I were talking about is how these traditional degrees in the education system, everyone's learning the same information. And not to discredit people who get their master's or PhD, it's obviously very impressive. Like, I'm not here to say like, I'm cooler than you because I didn't do it. That's not the case. But it, I feel like when you go through the education system, you are taught certain things and you are taught to approach things a certain way. And I think what I've enjoyed about not having the traditional educational experience going into the work I've been doing with mental health and psychology is it's allowed me to think really, really laterally because I'm not, you know, thinking back to my textbook of like, okay, if A, then B, or like, you know, this list of things is categorized as this. I also don't diagnose people. That's not something I do, but I've enjoyed how not going through the traditional education system has allowed me to think outside the box. And just to bring it back to the smartest person in the room, like I think that's kind of an issue we're seeing is anyone can regurgitate information. It's not that impressive for you to flip open a book and memorize a bunch of stuff and spit it out on a test that says, yep, you're smart. Soft skills like emotional intelligence and empathy and lateral thinking are so severely undervalued, but I do believe that's changing. People are putting more emphasis on being someone who treats people well on emotional intelligence, on, you know, empathy and being able to be someone who can form genuine relationships and long lasting relationships. Yeah. So it's a really interesting conversation topic to be sure. But from a team perspective, I just think so many companies don't have the right values in mind. No. I I worked with the team about two or three years ago. They had this architect. He basically designed the system, right? So he mm -hmm. was the most important person in the room, right? Because he literally put the wires together. <laughs> but he suffered from some severe mental um, health issues that mm -hmm. had 
catastrophic events or catastrophic effects on the rest of the team, right? Mm -hmm. It made it really hard for everybody to work. Mm -hmm. And do their their part right because if he if he hadn't if he wasn't in the right mental space that day, it was a hard day for everybody. Yeah. And I remember when I first joined, um, the VP pulls me aside and he's like, "Hey, um, just so you're aware, like this is how he works. So if he comes at you, don't take it personal." But I'm like, mm -hmm. "But it's so hard, like, to be a team and carry care for each other, and and value each other because I believe, I'm of the belief that." If you work on a team where you like truly trust each other, and mm -hmm. and I don't like, I know you a lot of people stereotype like you become a family. Like I'm not about that like whole family thing because at the end of the day, like you're just a number in the company, <laughs> yeah. Right. But <clears throat> there is this thing as trust and alliance, right? Like I'm really big on like loyalty, alliances, um, you know, just camaraderie in general, right? Mm -hmm. And like people that work that have like good bonding together and work well together and like kind of just at least trust each other, they tend to outperform anybody else right mm -hmm. because when you can work together like it just makes a world of a difference right mm -hmm. and so any thoughts on like mental health with respect to just that that scenario right like what do you do when you have somebody that's i don't, I don't want to say that we're challenging or difficult right but it's it's different it, yeah no 100 percent. so what i love to say is that mental health struggles or neurodivergence are always an explanation they are never a justification and i can say this as someone who for a portion of my life was incredibly difficult and challenging because of the issues I had. Like I didn't know how to self-regulate. So my problems became everyone else's problems because it spills. And I think there's this mindset of, well, I have these issues because something happens to me when I was a child, right? Like I had this hard childhood and now I have these issues or I was born this way and I had no control over it. And that's completely valid and true. And you're allowed to be frustrated and upset about those things, but you are not allowed to let that pain spill out onto other people. So yes, wildly unfair that you were born with this mental illness, wildly unfair that you have trauma that, you know, gave you anxiety, depression in the later years of your life, not your fault. Unfortunately, yes, your job to figure it out and rectify it so that you are not traumatizing other people. And I think, you know, like the one piece of rhetoric that I really want to avoid in the work I do is that everyone needs to dance around people with mental health issues and accommodate them. No, there's a be very beautiful middle ground. We don't want to say like, hey, sucks about your brain. Like, I'm not going to help you out at all because that's just not kind, but also like the entire system doesn't need to change to accommodate one person or to accommodate these struggles. Like people need to have systems in place to assist themselves, but also there needs to be a level of empathy and understanding and grace that comes from the outside. So the, the, that internal and that external need to work together. So in regards to your situation, like I don't think it's appropriate for you to come in and have someone just tell you like, yeah, sometimes he's just the worst, deal with it. Like, no, <laughs> like that's, that's not how that should happen. What I would do in that situation is come in and be like, okay, on bad days, what's our communication system? And then how can everyone else alter their workflow to like maybe just avoid this guy on his bad days? Like, what do we not need him for? Like, does he need to be in this meeting if he's going to snap at everybody? Or can we just send him minutes later? Like, if there's a question that only he can answer, maybe he's less confrontational if it's, you know, a written communication versus like a face to face video chat meeting kind of conversation. There's always these kind of just different mitigating things that we can do to work with someone's brain without disrupting the rest of the company or the rest of the team to accommodate their needs. But, and I think, sorry, but I was gonna say, how do you create a culture though to help with that? Because I don't like, I never not want to work with someone. Yeah. Right. Like I always want to work with everybody, but at the same time, like I can't be spiking my anxiety and my stress because it's challenging, right? Like there's got to be like a better way to communicate or, or at least have an understanding of each other and and help each other. Yes. And it, it all starts with being graciously curious. I just funny enough, I just recorded a different video about this. Um, asking the right questions is one of the best things you can do. And I think that that doesn't just apply for people struggling with mental health issues. That just is human nature in general we are no longer curious before we get combative. We go straight to defense mode. We go straight to like, you know, fight, anger, all of that stuff, instead of getting genuinely curious about why people do the things they do. And you see- but how do you even approach that though? <laughs> you, you have to, unfortunately, so much of this healing and so much of this growth will come from being the bigger person, right? So like, 
not letting people get under your skin. I'm going to, this is great. Actually, I plan on putting an article out tomorrow called becoming the jello man. And the concept is there's three different types of people you can be. You can be made of stone where you let nothing in and everything bounces off you and running into you is hard and painful. You can be a tissue paper man where everything tears through you and leaves you broken and, you know, torn apart and in shatters. Or you can be the jello man where you are able to absorb things that resonate with you, but other things just kind of bounce off and it doesn't do any damage in the process. And that's one of the main things I had to learn getting older was, you know, I found myself being very, very sensitive to certain things and very easily overstimulated to certain things. And people in my life who I'm very close to who love me, they do make accommodations to try to help not overstimulate me or like with all, you know, to make my life a little bit easier. But a lot of it is also just taking the responsibility to self soothe Like I'm upset. Start with asking that question. Why am I upset? Am I actually angry or am I afraid? Am I actually angry or am I feeling rejected and hurt? Okay. Now that I've identified what the actual emotion is, let me work backwards and see where that comes from. Well, my boss told me that I didn't get this project done perfect the first time. And it made me angry. Why? Because it reminds me of when I never felt good enough as a child or when an authority figure made me feel like I wasn't smart or I wasn't worthy. A lot of times, the interaction we're having, the emotion we're having is not about what's actually going on. My therapist actually said it best. She said, the stronger the reaction, the less it has to do with you. And that's incredibly powerful because I think when you're interacting with someone on like a one-to-one basis and there's not trauma involved, you are able to have a very calm conversation where you see those very emotional reactions or those very intense reactions. A lot of time that's about the person having the reaction more so than it is about you. And so having that information, I mean, it's not ever going to be a perfect science, right? Like there are people who are going to be shitty and are not going to want to stop being shitty. And the only thing we have power of over as an individual is how we react to that. And then the energy that we put out into the world. So like, if that person wants to be that way, fine, that doesn't have to affect me. And that doesn't have to affect how I'm going to treat other people. Right. And that's interesting because I can see this going both ways, right? So in my mind, as you're talking, I can see this from from a sort like if I had mental health issues, I would want help, right? I would, I would want somebody to help coach me through through this. But at the same time, I can also see it like being a person who who has worked with folks with mental health issues. I'm not trained for it. I remember one time I worked in a really cutthroat environment um, in the defense sector. I wasn't anybody special. But I, I sat in a war room. We called it the war room because yep. it was it was always happening all day long. Yeah. And I remember though so distinctively, like this lady came in one time and she just started crying. And and I'm panicking. I'm like, I've I've never, I don't even know what to do. And guys aren't even the most empathetic in general, right? <laughs> like, yeah. so, so in general, like I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm either gonna get fired or or I'm gonna really mess this up <laughs> or and like that was the only thing that was going through my mind and I, I couldn't even hear what she was saying because mm-hmm. I was freaking out like I'm like I have no idea how to handle this situation so I think that'd be it'd be interesting to see like you can help both parties <laughs> yeah definitely well and I think like something that's so interesting to me is that we don't talk about de-escalation when we learn how to go into the corporate world um And this is one of the things that that I'm really passionate about in the work that I do is I feel like there's so many managerial trainings that teach you how to like keep everything at an arm's distance. Like they almost dissuade you from empathy because they're trying to be like, Hey, don't be an HR liability by giving someone a hug if they're crying. And I think that that's, that's part of the issue too, is everyone's so trigger happy on lawsuits that you, you can't, it's harder to connect with people because harder to be a human. Yes. Like I remember God, I think it was someone at team um, asked me if they could give me a compliment. Like they came up to me and they said, is it okay if I tell you that you look really nice today? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they just, you know, it's one of those things where you don't know because there's this obviously horrible things have happened to people and I'm not downplaying that, but we are now getting taught how to keep everything arm's distance all the time. And because of that, we're not being taught how to show up and how to not be arm's distance. And there's really basic things that managers or even just, you know, while you're doing the sexual harassment training, throw in your de-escalation training in that because there's really simple things you can do when someone's having an episode like that. Um, Like I know for my episodes that I'll have sometimes, the advice that my therapist gave my partner was, you know, like, 
the human brain is always about survival. So one of the number one things they recommend to do when someone's having a dissociative episode, a panic attack, any one of those, you know, very like kind of emotional episodes is to get them a glass of water. And that's not because they're thirsty, but it's because it does something in the brain where if you provide a resource, one, you can't hyperventilate while you're drinking water because you can only drink or breathe. You can't do both. <laughs> um, so that automatically will slow down the breathing, which will slow down the heart rate. And it also tells the brain, I have a viable resource right now. Therefore, I'm not in danger, right? Like if you're sipping a glass of water, your brain goes, oh, water. Water is something I need to survive. I have access to it right now. Maybe I'm not in the danger. I think I am. And from there, the, the central nervous system starts to kind of decompress and regulate itself. Uh, and that's something that's so simple. That's not told to people or like to distract them. You know, like if someone's hyperventilating, you get them a glass of water and then you're like, did you see like the bagels they had in the waiting room? Did you, like did you get their brain on something else. It goes back to the conversation we were having earlier about pain. Distract. If you can distract and, and provide them with a resource, ground them, right? Like here's a glass of water. Let's talk about something else. Let's get your brain over here because you're right here right now. Let's get you over here. Um, and, and that's, that's so simple and it's not being taught and it's not being advertised as something that people need to know in the workplace because we've got somewhere between like 33 and 50% of the population that struggles from some type of either neurodivergence or mental health issue. So it's crazy. not going away. <laughs> yeah, no, it's crazy. Um, I was listening to a podcast, and, and if you're uncomfortable with this topic, do let me know. But um, I was listening. Uh, I'm trying to learn. Um, I listened to some guy. I think it's the diary of a CEO, and he was interviewing a like a fasting doctor. So I'm mm -hmm. trying to do like intermittent fasting, and she was talking about like how our like chemically as humans that we are, right? It, it has way more control over us than we give any credit, mm -hmm. and even worse, have any knowledge of. Mm -hmm. right because like when you're in a fight or flight like mm -hmm. my mom and my dad a classic example my, my mom was like why is your dad the way he is because when my, my mom likes to yell she's mm -hmm. she's a yeller yeah right and so my dad instantly hits a fight or flight and my dad freezes like my mm -hmm. every word that comes out of my mom's mouth is, is gone on my dad like he didn't hear a single thing and my mom just gets more aggravated because she's like yeah. how can you just stand there and not do anything right i'm like because you're yelling at him and his his yeah system is stuck right like don't yell and you're gonna get a better response out of him right but again we don't we just don't have these trainings and and understandings of how these things work right and um yeah. and the reason i'm bringing that up again is because of this thing we're talking about the the podcast was talking about how to work with females mm. right and it's the the your cycle is so critical to your emotions and your feelings and, oh, yeah. and and when you take offense to things when you're happy when you're more aggressive to like get things done mm -hmm. and so i've been really trying to understand my wife's cycle and, and see how we can talk better because like right now we're not happy but we're right at the telling of the cycle yeah. so now i know to approach things a little bit differently right because it's not that she's mad at me it's just cycle like biologically we're so different and it's such a we don't talk enough about how men and women can work together given the fact that their cycle is involved Yes. Well, and then the thing that you factor into that as well is that different types of birth control can affect your cycle differently. Like I know when I was on hormonal birth control, I was on the pill for almost 10 years and I didn't really PMS when I was on the pill because everything was so dampened. Right. And something that I had to learn when I went on non-hormonal birth control was that I, and it's so funny you say it from the partner's perspective, because I had to learn this about myself and then my partner, unfortunately, had to learn it about me as well. Because the way that my brain works in my cycle, which is like everyone's watching this is like, this isn't about Jira at all. Well, guess what? You're learning about hormones today. Well, it's um, all about teamwork, right? I think you can't work in a team if you don't understand the influences internally and externally that they have in their lives. No, 100%. And but Jira is not going to solve the problem. Like I always tell people, like you can't solve the problem you're describing to me with Jira. Yes. It's a people problem. And yes. so this well, is why it's irrelevant. <laughs> and that's, I've seen so many companies do this where things aren't working. And so they iterate on process and they iterate on process and they iterate on process. I'm like, oh my God, it's not your process. It's you. You are just not doing this well. And you are not leading your people well. And that's why things aren't working. Like, I think, I think maybe Rob Heen said it where he's like, it's not the tool. 
right? Like there's only so much the tool can do for okay, you. I just said it like three seconds ago. <laughs> I know you just said it too, but like he, said, he, said it, he said it in such a concise way that I forget where it was. But um, you said somebody said, I love Rob. <laughs> I know, you're like, you're like David Rob. Um, I don't know, Alex is like, hey, here is a word. And I go, Rob said that. Yeah, Rob said that. <laughs> but no, just with, with the cycles, like it really does play into things. And, but I think too, recognizing anger as an emotion is when we're talking about men and women working together, do women get more emotionally invested in things? Yes. But men get angrier more often. And that's still an emotion. Um, and one of the most powerful things I was able to learn in my life was that anger is a preliminary emotion to an actual emotion. And obviously sometimes, yeah, someone just ticks you off and you're actually angry. But a lot of times when we feel anger, it's actually fear. It's actually rejection. It's actually sadness. It's actually loneliness. And our body, because of that fight and flight response that you were talking about, anger is like, stay away from me. I'm vulnerable. I'm hurt. White, like wounded animal syndrome is something we see a lot more in men than we do in women, where if they feel hurt, they will get violent. If they feel hurt, they will get angry. Whereas um, women will just be hurt a lot of the time, right? It's, um, and so when it comes to men and women working together, I think the key is recognizing that men and women are equally as emotional. They're just emotional in different ways. And that that emotion is part of the human experience. Like you cannot show up to work and be a robot. It's not healthy. It's not sustainable. And it eats away at you. You're going to have emotions. You're going to have emotional reactions. The key is to one, understand that other people are going to have them. Two, understand that you will also have them. And three, learn how to react accordingly, whether it's reacting to yourself or reacting to someone else. It's really, it's not rocket science, but everyone wants everything to be so damn personal all the time. Sometimes it's really just not that personal. Um, and I think it's it's recognizing that. Yeah, but I think it goes back to your curiosity though, right? Like just recently, I, um, I had a friend, uh, well, I consider her a friend, right? And she had a problem with, mm -hmm. with Jura. Mm -hmm. So I was like, no, I don't think that's what you want. <laughs> like, like it's part of my job as a Jira admin is to guide you and, and say no to you a lot, mm -hmm. right? I have to say no, but that I find myself in the receiving end of now, like, I don't want to say word hate, but mm -hmm. people resent me a little bit more because I'm blocking them from making progress because mm -hmm. I'm not complying to whatever they want. Right. And in this particular case, again, my friend asked me for something, but um, she had just suffered from a death in the family. Mm -hmm. so her reaction to me saying no caught me off guard mm -hmm. and and any other like i don't want to say the word immature but any other immature person would be like i can't believe she said that like and then just completely put her like put this person on like a, on a blacklist and just say never again right like yeah and that friendship right but because i have this understanding and and this desire to to actually want to work with this individual um i could kind of turn the cheek a little bit right and i don't think mm -hmm. a lot of people I don't, I don't think a lot of people know to turn when and how to turn the cheek mm -hmm. for the greater good. They just, it's very ego and like you hurt me and it's about me. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, and, and releasing ego. It sounds so touchy feely to say it. And I remember when I heard it early in my mental health and therapy journey, it was like, release the ego. I was like, shut up, shut up. Like who's going to do that in today's society where everything's individualistic and everything's on social media and we're all big stars in our own minds and our private movies that no one's actually watching. <laughs> Except <We're mine>. release <laughs> ego? Please, uh, please. Yeah. But you have to choose that. And, and, and I sit here and I say this now as someone who I haven't done it, please. Like I, I literally just said something the other, I love attention. Like I, you think I would do what I do and talk the way I talk if I didn't love attention? Of course I do. But there's a difference between enjoying attention and thinking the world revolves around you. And that's, I think the difference that we need to realize as a society is no one, no one's actually watching. Everyone is so involved in their own stuff that no one actually cares about you as much as you think they do. And no one's coming to save you. That that's just, that's it. And all of that peace and all of that strength needs to come from within. And that starts with releasing ego, because as long as you hold on to the ego, everything can hurt you. Everything can touch you. That's exactly where narcissism actually comes from is feeling so vulnerable and rejected that you build up this larger than life personality and this self-centeredness to protect yourself. And, you know, we're seeing 
more and more narcissists. But I think a big part of that is it's easier to turn to those coping mechanisms that are very like attention grabbing. It's it, it's I'll, I'll say I'll say it from experience, like getting a dopamine hit from someone liking my stuff on LinkedIn or like saying I'm pretty on Instagram. Yeah, so much easier than going to therapy, doing the work, recognizing my own shortcomings, but also so much more short lived. Like dopamine hits from social media are the cocaine of the tech world. Like that's all it is. It makes you feel good for five seconds. It's gone. Really and then you're gone. getting a hit again and again and again. And the next thing you know, your nose is collapsing. And you're like, oh my God, what happened? You're an asshole now because you got all of your validation externally. <laughs> when you should have been getting it. I, I, I can definitely see that because going back to our topic of imposter syndrome, I suffered with, with imposter syndrome like my entire career, especially mm -hmm. in my college years. My wife is older than me. But not only is she older than me, she's the same major as me, same school as me, same Damn. professors as me. So she had every test, every quiz, every homework, everything I needed to graduate. I had my own personal tutor. Mm -hmm. And so the level of effort that I put into graduating from college went way down, especially since I started my career in college. So I mm -hmm. was working at the Boeing company my sophomore year. So and I worked at the Boeing my entire most of my college career. So my job was to graduate and C's get degrees. <laughs> That's all I cared oh. about. But, but the amount of resentment that I got from like my peers was so bad because mm -hmm. they saw that I got to take home the tutor. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and I say that because today, like I'm ready to talk Jira at any point. Right. Mm -hmm. And I have zero imposter syndrome, but I catch myself that I sometimes sound very cocky. Mm -hmm. Right. Like the level of like confidence that I have in Jira is sometimes condescending. Yeah. And and I don't do it like intentionally, but at least yeah. I can catch it, right? But it, it comes because of that, right? Like it's like I'm overcoming, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, <I> be. <laughs> yeah. Well, but I mean, but the, the pendulum swings, right? Like this is a conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, my partner and I just celebrated our one year anniversary. Yeah. And of course, me being me and being like a, a person who loves to study human beings, I made him do not an exit interview because obviously like we're still together, but like basically like a hey, like. Let's look at the last year. And let's year renewal. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Can you let's renew your subscription? Um, but no, like I was like, let's look at the last year and talk about what went well in our relationship and what we want to work on going into the next year. And one of the things he gave me a note on is that I was my pendulum was over here. And then I realized, oh crap, my pendulum's over here. So I overcompensated, I overcorrected, and I went so far the opposite direction on something. And he's like, I would love if we could middle it out here. Right. And, and that's something I've been very cognizant of when it comes to like my own journey with my professional career is I came out of college and I thought I knew everything because I was like 22. And then I swung too far the other direction. And I was like, wait, I don't know anything. I'm lucky to even be given a chance. And I let people walk all over me. And I'm starting to kind of come back now to this middle ground where I'm like, I'm smart, but I don't know everything. And being open to learn. But the first start is recognizing it in yourself, right? That self-awareness. But then step two is action, right? So you recognizing, okay, get condescending about this is step one. And then you changing your tone is step two. You don't have to be perfect all the time. But I think where a lot of people fall short is they have self-awareness and they'll be like, oh yeah, I do this thing. I'm not going to do anything about it. <laughs> not going to do anything about it. Everyone's like, And it's like, okay, well, so that's not how we're going to do this, right? Um, but yeah, I, I think it's hard when you are, I know I run into this a lot where I can come off as defensive or condescending because of the tone of my voice. And part of that has to do with my different neurodivergences. Like I'm not always aware of the tone of my voice. The first time I had someone tell me I sounded, you know, bitchy was the fourth grade. I was eight. And I remember she said, you need to watch your tone when you speak to the other children. Cause you know, this, that, and the other thing. And I remember going, what do you mean? And she's like, just like that, like that, exactly what you just did. But for me, I was just like, I'm asking a question. I don't, you know. Um, How come girls have that and guys don't? Yeah. I've always been curious, right? Like, why do girls get labeled that, but a guy can be confident and there's not, there's no label to that? You know, Alex, if I had the answer to that question, we would be, be in different right places of society. I think we'd be, it, we'd be having this interview on an island somewhere, right? <laughs> yeah, right. I feel like we figured it out. Men and women are living peacefully. We don't have to cancel anyone anymore. Well, kumbaya. Um, <laughs> God, a girl can dream. I, I think part of it is uh, we take on these different roles as we get older where any precocious little kid, regardless of gender, is adorable, right? Like any little have you kid. Met my kids? Like, huh? <laughs> Have you met my kids? I haven't met your kids. <laughs> You're like, they're not adorable. <laughs> they are very. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
but like, I, I remember when I was a little girl, right? Like I was incredibly precocious and I was very articulate and very inquisitive. And all of my parents' friends thought I was just adorable, but it was those exact same traits that got me alienated and ostracized as I got older because I always wanted to ask questions. I always wanted to know what was going on. I wouldn't just, you know, accept things as they came. And because I wasn't this little cute thing anymore and I was supposed to be a woman, I was supposed to be quiet. I was supposed to be elegant. I was supposed to be poised, charismatic, but not too in your face, like, like well-spoken, but not too loud, right? Not too opinionated. I was supposed to speak the right amount and do the right amount. And, and I think it's on the same side for men is you're supposed to be bossy. But who defines all these things? <laughs> huh? Who in society gets to define all these rules? The people with the money. People. And the people with the power, which is still overwhelmingly white men. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's interesting to see because like one not not to cut you off there, but um mm -hmm. one of the things that I was thinking of when you were saying all this, right? It's like, is the root of all of our problems then like in our childhood? Like <sighs> Yeah, and also in oh my gosh, there's this, these amazing studies now coming out about generational trauma where even if you have a great childhood, if your parents didn't, and they have like physical changes that occurred within their body because they had a traumatic childhood, you can have a perfect childhood and their trauma genuinely physically gets passed to you. Like I it, believe it. it alters. Yeah. It alters your genetic chemistry, be it the sperm or the egg in the parent. Those, those, it gets altered. It changes. Trauma changes your reproductive organs and your reproductive, you know, your little guys that go out and actually make the baby. Like it, it gets passed down. And so it, it doesn't even, it's not even enough anymore, unfortunately, to be a great parent. Because if you like, I, I'm going to probably pass on some weird stuff to my kids, despite all the work I've done, you know, like it's, it's fascinating. Um, because even as society changes, we're not only cleaning up our own mess. We're like, we've got stuff on let's bring it back to jira the backlog is slammed man it's not just the current sprint like we've got a whole a whole backlog that we've got to deal with too and it's it's actually wild yeah and it's interesting you say that because um have you ever seen uh defending jacob on apple yeah, TV? I, I read it it was one of my favorite books in my yeah, well, i didn't even know the book but there's a the, they did the tv show and the little kid who allegedly killed somebody right they were looking to see if he had that killer's gene mm -hmm. and i'm like well, you can pass like anger yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's uh, you can pass down you can pass down everything and i think that's why like i know my little brother doesn't want kids because he like he looked at my dad and he looked at stuff and he was like i don't need to risk it like i came out on the other side of this i don't need to risk passing that on to my child um i'm so on the choice then though at any point hmm doesn't isn't everything a choice though at one point? Like even if you have bad genes, don't you get to wake up in the morning and make a choice? I mean, yes, you, you have be? to be, especially as a child, you have to be surrounded with people who foster that in you, right? Like if I'm a child and I get let's we'll, we'll use that anger gene, right? For example. I'm a child, I'm born with this anger gene, and I have these outbursts where I'm just infuriated, I throw things, I hit people. I can have, just to make it black and white, one of two caregivers. I can have the caregiver that is patient with me, that teaches me how to self-soothe, that teaches me how to name my emotions, that teaches me like, yep, I've got this thing. Here's how I mitigate it. And that requires patience, that requires energy, that requires time, and a lot of times that requires financial resources that people either just might not have because they don't or might not be willing to expend on their child because not everyone should be a parent. It's just the truth. Um, on the other side of that, someone who's not willing to provide any of those four things. Like maybe my child throws a temper tantrum and I yell back. So now I'm in a screaming match with my child and they learn that's how to handle things. Or I want to help my child, but I can't afford to get them a professional. So to the best of my ability, I try to teach them how to cope, but I don't do it correctly. Or I don't have the patience after a long day. I'm a single mom. I come home exhausted and I don't want to deal with my kids. So I just let them scream and throw and do whatever until they wear themselves out. It's, it is a choice, but a lot of these behaviors get solidified in our childhood. And if we don't have caregivers who provide that to us in childhood, then we have to parent ourselves as adults. It's actually, it's called reparenting. And it's um, something that's really common in therapy now is parenting yourself the way that your parents should have parented you. And 
So, but it's a lot, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. A lot of those neural pathways have already formed. They're a lot stringier and more malleable when we're young. By the time we're adults, they can still be changed, right? Trauma changes the brain, but healing can also change the brain. But it's a lot harder to, like, those. they're thus malleable, those neural pathways, right? And connecting them to the right places is a lot more difficult and requires a lot more work and consistent work. As a kid, you can have like one or two experiences that like snap things into place. As an adult, you have to do this repetitive work to retrain your brain. And a lot of people don't have the time, energy, or resources as adults to do it. I right. It's just, I, I, I'm bringing it back down to team, right? As you're saying all these things, I'm thinking like by the time, I'll share a similar story, not not 100% related, but mm-hmm. my wife, well, when I used to live in St. Louis, bringing it right back to the beginning of the conversation. Yeah, tornadoes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tornadoes, yeah. When I lived in St. Louis, um, I used to help run Boeing's um, STEM education outreach program. Mm-hmm. And I would basically teach kids how to think like engineers. Mm-hmm. Psychology being not anything that's anywhere near our radar at yeah. all, which I think is a big miss. Right now that I'm looking back and reminiscing, I was like, wow, would I wish I would have actually had to take more psychology classes as an engineer? Because math only gets you so far, you still have to work with people. Yeah. I think this applies for every industry, right? Like we can't, there's no work out there that's just me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like everything requires people. Cause I, again, I'm, I'm such doing such tangents, right. But mm-hmm. every night I think about like, how can I make a living without having to interface with people? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the answer is never an answer yeah. that I yeah. want to hear because <laughs> you can't. And sometimes I'm like, you know what? I might, might as well just learn how to deal or work with people that are challenging or difficult mm-hmm. that, that make my life not easy. Right. Yeah. Cause it's, I think it'll be easier in the long run. But anyways, coming back to St. Louis, um, when I left St. Louis and I came to California, I tried to find an outreach program very similar to what I was doing at Boeing. Mm-hmm. And I tried to go like at the high school level, not no interest there, middle school, no interest. So I was like, you know what? Like you got to get to these kids like almost by kindergarten. Because if you're trying to teach a kid in college to become an engineer, like it's too late by then, right? Like you got to literally get them almost like an infancy. Mm-hmm. As the younger, the better. But now I'm hearing like, from a psychologically perspective too, we're also messing up our kids way sooner in life than, than we probably give credit for or, yeah. or our understanding of. Well, and I think my, my mom has this beautiful thing she used to tell me where I think part of the reason I know I want to be a mother one day is because I had an amazing mom. She's 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 one of those people who was meant to be a mother. I never met your mom, but she sounds phenomenal. Oh, From she's the story she does, that we've he does, he does the man, like so literally. Um, but she used to always uh like if there was a baby crying in church or something or a kid screaming, she would always turn to me and say, You see that child right there? I'd be like, Yeah, and she goes, That will be your child one day. For some reason, regardless of how good of a mother you are. So never say my child would never because your child probably will. And I think part of the reason, despite having an adverse childhood that I turned out okay, was because my mom never had her head in the sand about who I was, right? Like she was never the parent who, if someone was like, hey, Ray was, you know, mean or Ray spray painted the classroom that she was like, my child would never. She was like, no, that sounds like my daughter. She will be punished accordingly, you know? Fourth but grade was, Ray. <laughs> Well, yeah, but it was like it allowed her as a parent to accept me as 100% who I am. I have never been forced by my mother to be someone I'm not. And that's my good with my bad. And I think that's the number one thing that we can do for our children is because we're never going to get it right. Right. Like I go to all this therapy. I work my ass off. I can study child psychology until I'm blue in the face. I'm still going to fuck up my kids completely on accident, not on purpose. And I've done more work than most. That doesn't mean I'm going to be a perfect parent. It just doesn't. It doesn't, there's no perfect parenting, regardless of what they're trying to sell you on Instagram these days, you are never going to be a perfect parent. Um, But I think allowing space for your children to be who they are is the number one thing you can do as a parent, because what it teaches your child very early on is confidence and problem solving. If you instill nothing else in your children other than those two things, they will be okay, because all they need to know is that who they are is enough. And that any mess they get themselves into, they can figure it out. That's it. Like I didn't have a law growing up, but I had those two things. And every mess I've gotten myself into, I've figured it out. And I have had times where I'm insecure. But like at the end of the day, I've always been pretty confident in who I am. And that I know I'm a person trying to do good things. And that I'm worthy of being like loved and cared for. And that's it. Very beautifully said. 
Thank you. Um, got a few minutes left here. Um, let's talk about Hurricane Consulting. <laughs> we haven't even. What do you do, and what are you hoping to get out of that? What do I do? I do this. I talk to people, and I provide um, kind of these perspectives. I, I like to tell. Uh, I like to joke that it's business therapy, um, and it's transitioning a little bit more into life coaching. So it doesn't just have to be your business; it can be you, the person as well. But I think what I lacked until I started therapy. Now my family will talk about mental health a lot, right? Because I kind of started this movement in my family where now we'll talk about things. And I think if you don't have that environment in your workplace or you don't have that environment in your personal life, like someone to just say, hey, am I being out of line here? Or hey, is there a way to work around this? Or hey, like this woman came in crying and I had no idea what to do. Like how can I mitigate these things in the future? And basically what I do is I go in and I just kind of teach people how to be people. Um, <laughs> that should be your tagline. Teach, you know? Teaching people how to be people. You should, that literally should be your business where you're like, you teach people how to be people and you just charge individuals to be people. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like, I don't want to like, okay. <laughs> I don't want to commoditize the human experience because too many people have already beat me to that train. And I would yeah, we got 8 billion clientele, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. It's like everyone could use my business. Um, but yeah, no, I, it's, it's, it's really just about bringing the people element back to business. And kind of like you said, right? Like one of my favorite things in my tech career was working with engineers. I understood their brains. I understood them as well as I did because I had that psychology background. And I found that people who were, you know, maybe a little bit different or like are normally pretty ostracized or introverted were drawn to me because I was like, Hey, like, I don't care that you're weird. I'm weird. We're both weird together. You're quiet, weird. I'm loud, weird. Let's just join forces. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's yeah. Uh, so I'm, what I'm hoping to accomplish with it, honestly, I wish I could sit here and tell you that I'm hoping to make a billion dollar business and be on Forbes 30 under 30. I'm not, I, it's really, um, it sounds once again, it sounds very eat, pray, love, but I just, I see a lot of miserable people. And I guess my main goal is if I can make people a little bit more happy, yeah, like if I can make people a little bit less miserable. Um, I can just see so much tremendous value in that team building, right? Like, like I said, I think so many times companies and businesses and teams specifically, we attribute a lack of skill. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a lack of skill. Like anybody can learn anything. Like it's, we have yeah. chat GPT for crying out loud. Right? Yeah. You, you can learn anything you want, but being able to work with somebody because you don't, maybe it's a cycles thing again, right? Maybe mm -hmm. it's the mental health. Maybe it's something else. I can't pronounce the N word that you were saying. Neurodivergent. Neuro neurodivergent. Yeah, that one. <laughs> right. Maybe it's some of that. Like, but we, I might, none of my professional career have, have I ever been exposed to some help in that department. Mm -hmm. And, I, looking back, I would attribute almost every problem I've had in my career in the last what, 14 years of it to one of those problems. Yeah. And it's no, crazy. It's, there's no help out there for that. No, no, there's not. Well, and it's also, I think leaders aren't trained how to identify people that do need help. Um, I remember with Hurricane Consulting, I developed a completely proprietary system called Intention Activation Groups, which is for leaders. It's like a shortcut to identify employees that might need extra assistance. And when I was researching, cause I was like, okay, I want to see if other stuff like this exists. I want to see like other work people have done, yada, yada. All of it was just like how to identify an employee struggling with mental health. Like, and it was all these like very obvious things. Like they recently had a death in the family or like they cry or like their projects don't get done. And it's like, okay, great. But that doesn't teach you why they might be struggling. And so what intention activation groups kind of aims to do is like, there's people who have no intention, right? Like maybe they're emotionally disconnected or they're just, you know, activations unlikely. Like they're just never going to be good workers. Um, it happens rarely. You can usually spot them within three months, but those people are kind of a wash. But like in, intention, absent, emotional disconnect. These are people who like used to be star players. And then all of a sudden they're not involved in culture. They're not executing they, the way they used to, which is a completely different problem than people who are intention present, execution and consistent, right? This is someone who's involved in culture and they've got a great kind of attitude, but their execution is really hit or miss. Like sometimes they're missing deadlines. Sometimes they're a rock star. And then on top of that, then you've got people where there's extra mentorship required, which is a different issue to have. And so just because someone needs help doesn't mean they need the same kind of help as someone who would maybe be showing like the same symptoms. Right. We're going to um, need a lot of race. 
<laughs> yeah, well, when I can afford to have more me's, um, I will hire them. But the goal right now is that I'm able to go into companies and give leadership trainings that involve intention activation groups and empathy, like we talked about, so that leaders that already exist within companies can be mini rays. Um, I don't right. claim to have all the answers, but yeah, I think, at least I think just raising point. awareness, right? Like I until I met you, mm. I could have never put a I don't want to say label, man, but it's I couldn't have told you what the problem was for the last 14 years of my career mm -hmm. and because so many people just like have a little bit of friction and they're like screw this i'm gonna go get another job yeah right and then they just flee but there's so much more value like you still take your problems and your baggage with you mm -hmm. and it's so much i would find that there's so much more value to really get to the root cause of like why are you fleeing like what's mm -hmm. the problem like because again until you figure out how to make money without interacting with people <laughs> yeah it's going to be something that plagues you for a really long time. Oh, yeah. That feeling you're talking about can be summed up perfectly. There's a sentence. You are everywhere you go. <laughs> everywhere you go. You are just full of, like, captions today. <laughs> I can't compare it with a short list. Yeah. <laughs> you got a whiteboard with all the all your talking points in the back. <laughs> but, yeah, no, again, awareness it would be so powerful because I can see what you're doing like applying just to scrum masters, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mentioned earlier, right? Uh, I train scrum masters. I, I do yeah. a lot of training myself, right? But the biggest challenge I always get is like, why can't we complete our sprints? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, why why is it that our work rolls over from sprint to sprint? And and I always tell them, again, not having any information that I've had after talking to you, but my answer before was, the reason you can't have it is because your engineers, right? They're, mm -hmm. they're very prideful, right? Like, Mm -hmm. they're so artists you, but well for you to earn an engineering degree isn't something that's trivial right like it does require mm -hmm. a certain level of cognitive workload to get that piece of paper mm -hmm. right and i think I'll, I'll tell you a little side story here real quick before we before we end but yeah. because these folks are so smart right and it's challenging for them to admit that something's wrong with their code or something's wrong mm -hmm. somewhere right that they have a problem mm -hmm. right like they're gonna figure it out before anybody knows that they have a problem yeah right? they're gonna try to right but when they can't it just delays and delays and delays and eventually you have your your stories not being finished nobody's asking for help because everybody's mm -hmm. like well we did a daily scrum mm -hmm. or we have our stand-up we have our retrospectives nothing comes up it's like nobody's gonna admit right because we don't have yeah. this we don't have this safe culture. We don't have this vulnerable culture where we can talk about these things. Because again, there's no training on it. There's no, there's no way to do it without feeling you're going to get fired. Yeah. And, yeah. And so I, I, that's usually where I tell my scrum masters. But then they're like, well, what am I supposed to do with this? Like, I can't talk to people because, again, there's no playbook for how to talk to people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. And it's, I think sometimes that safety word, right? Safety is the number one thing that we are always seeking as human beings. And that's where a lot of these issues come from is seeking that feeling of safety. One of the things I implemented with my last engineering team was an anonymous form that like before our standups, they could submit questions. They could submit, you know, concerns or gripes with leadership specifically. And it was all anonymous and we would address them anonymously during our daily scrum meetings. Um, and it got to the point where it created enough conversation that eventually we did away with the form entirely because it created enough of a dialogue where people felt safe to just share these anonymous right. things now. That, publicly. That's what I was going to so, say, because I'm like, high performance teams don't have an anonymous form. High performance teams just talk about it. Yeah, but sometimes the training wheels of, can I have this conversation and still feel safe? That level of anonymity gives people that feeling of safety until they're ready to, to mm -hmm. have that dialogue um, non-anonymously, so. <laughs> yeah, um, I was going to tell you a side story. Um, I read an article a few years ago about um, Google suffering with a lot of sexual harassment um, cases. Interesting. Right? I, I don't know if you ever saw it. And the yes. reason was because, again, you got these really, really smart, introverted people mm -hmm. um, that never, never had any, like, love interests right or, or we're never mm -hmm. the, or we're never the receiving end of a love interest because i think you can like somebody and have a crush on someone but that, that like is really the key part <laughs> like getting it back <laughs> is really what what completes the yeah. <laughs> the engagement there and so there, there's these folks right that usually grew up being neglected by the opposite sex mm -hmm. um not ever being part of the cool kids club right not going to parties not being what was it boys and booze <laughs> no definitely yep. boys and boys yeah <laughs> I was gonna say, your college experience was the 180 of my experience. <laughs> In fact, it wasn't until Team 24, Sean Doyle, he, uh, he he gave me my first beer. 
Here oh, I yeah? 35 years old. I have my, I shared my first beer with Sean and immediately spit it in his face because beer's disgusting. <laughs> it's not great. Yeah, it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, um, so you, so Google went through this period where like all these, they, they only hire those kind of people though, right? Like mm-hmm. for, a per, for a period of time, Google was only hiring really, 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 really smart people. And mm-hmm. in fact, they still do to this day, right? But they also then added marketing teams and legal teams and HR teams. And those people are not trained engineers. And they're usually not introverts. And so I feel, well, uh, before I get to that one, I'll finish the Google story, right? Yeah. So it turns out that these all these people started getting promoted and becoming managers. And all of a sudden, they have beautiful women on their teams. Mm. And now they're the ones in charge. Mm. The tables, the roles have changed. So they were having a lot of sexual harassment cases where like, the guy's like, okay, now I'm in charge. You now get to listen to me. <laughs> yeah. And, and so it created a lot of friction because, again, you just psychologically we're not ready <laughs> we, no we they're, well. it power they say this a lot with um the mindset about money but anytime you get power whether it's power financially or power in general quick power does something to the brain you need a slow ramp for most people into things like this because um the good analogy is like malnourished children right when they do all of those those charity projects or philanthropy projects they have to give the children very small bites very small, small, small meals, even though they're starving, because if they feed them a normal meal, when they're emaciated like that, they will die. And the same thing can be said for power and money. Like it needs to come slowly so that you adapt to it and keep your morals and your values. Otherwise you get this influx of power and you just explode into an asshole. Um, but you know, such as life, (laughs) such as life. (laughs) Well, Ray, I know we're at uh, right out of time. So I don't want to keep you more than I have to. I'll have to share my story of my wife and I both being engineers and okay. how our marriage looks because of that I in a later that. podcast. Yeah, absolutely. We'll have to, we'll have to come back. <laughs> and then, yeah, but it's so funny how we just started. We, I mean, we started talking about natural disasters and stuff because of your name. So um, thank you again, Ray, for being here. And this was, this was probably one of the best conversations I've ever had. One that I think more people need to be having. And one of the reasons why I definitely knew when I was doing this that I wanted to have you bright and early in the yeah. in the summer of uh, last in 3.0. Yeah. Well, no, thanks for having me. And I I am I will come back and nerd out on psychology and mental health anytime you'll have me, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Ray. This video was made possible by Resolution.